In this video, we're going to be discussing a suspension device that has been quite critical in maximizing aerodynamic performance of high-end racing cars. And that device is called the heave spring or third element. These devices have existed for a while in professional motorsport, but more and more are gaining traction lately in amateur motorsport in things like time attack and hill climb, where unrestricted aerodynamics has meant that we're getting more and more downforce on those cars and we need a way of dealing with that downforce. This is where the heave element comes in quite nicely. To start with, we need to talk a little bit about suspension modes. Now I've discussed this already in my video about the Project One suspension, but we're just going to do a quick recap and summary here. While it's often easy to think about suspension as individual wheels moving around on a car, we typically tend to classify it into four main modes, heave, pitch, roll, and warp. Now to break down these modes, we have heave, which is the movement of all four wheels up or down with respect to the body, such as you'd see if you apply downforce to the car or something like that. Pitch, which is a scenario such as when the car is under braking and the car rotates forwards or backwards, uh, and we'll see something like the front wheels move up with respect to the body and the rear wheels move down. Roll, which is where the car leans over, such as you'd see in a corner so that one side of the, the wheels on the car would move down with respect to the body and the other side will move up. And the last one, which is warp, where you essentially have a cross axle movement where one set of wheels moves up and the other set moves down. Uh, to think of this, think of something like a single wheel bump effectively enacts uh, this movement across the axles in addition to some of the other modes. Now, when we're trying to tune a, a race car to go around a circuit, we're going to tune each one of these modes separately. And we have certain targets that we want for each of these modes, whether that's a certain roll stiffness, whether that's certain pitch stiffnesses, heave stiffnesses, etc., etc. One of the more interesting ones though is heave, because heave, like I mentioned earlier, is related to downforce on the car, because we have all the wheels moving up or all the wheels moving down. Modes like pitch and roll are largely due to accelerations on the car because it's due to forces of the center of gravity uh, under different accelerations. Whereas heave is all downforce and downforce goes up as velocity squared. So as a result, we actually want fairly different characteristics in heave than we want in the other modes. And most importantly, we want a heave characteristic that starts to get a bit nonlinear. Now, because heave increases rapidly as the velocity squares, what we find is that when we're traveling at very high speeds with high amounts of downforce, we have a tendency for the car to want to bottom out. So what we want to do is have a heave characteristic where as the, the car gets lower and lower and lower or the wheels get higher and higher and higher, the springing in heave becomes stiffer and stiffer and stiffer. This ensures that as we have more downforce and getting towards the bottom of our suspension travel, we end up with a predictable heave characteristic and we don't end up bottoming the car and we get predictable aero characteristics. This is especially important when you consider the aerodynamic characteristics of the car as the ride height changes. Because as the car gets closer and closer to the ground, the sensitivity of the downforce numbers goes up significantly. So when we're close to the ground, we need to try and hold the car in a really tight range of ride heights in order to ensure we get peak downforce performance. So what we've determined from this is that we want a non-linear heave stiffness. And because of high downforce numbers, we want quite a high heave stiffness as well to ensure good ride control and good peak performance. Now what's worth noting is we don't want a really high or non-linear stiffness in roll. In addition to this, we want to ensure maximum mechanical grip, which means we want to keep our car soft. And we also want to be able to keep it so that this wheel can move up and down because if it just was infinitely stiff, then we would lose a lot of mechanical grip. We also use roll stiffness as a tool for managing front and rear balance by increasing and decreasing the roll stiffness across these axles. We wanna make sure that we can do that without upsetting the aero platform by changing the ride heights. So isolating roll and heave stiffness is a good idea. So the point of this introduction is, is that we want to be able to tune our heave and our roll stiffness separately on our car, and they have quite different requirements. Now let's have a look at an actual suspension system and talk about how we can achieve this. So what I've got here now is a 3D model of a race car and we're just gonna go through and talk about how the suspension works in the different modes that we previously discussed. 
Now you can see that what I've got here is a push rod suspension. So basically the suspension is actuated by having this push rod here go through to, to the inboard system where there'll be dampers and the springs and stuff like that. On a road car, this will often just have a direct damper or spring straight down on it, but the principle is more or less the same as what we're gonna to show today. So I'm just gonna hide those bodies and then let's have a look at the front suspension. So on a conventional car, what you'll have is you'll have two spring and damper units pushing your push rods or pushing your uprights directly. Now this isn't actually a super great system for tuning your different suspension modes and I'll explain why. So let's just say we want to adjust our heave stiffness. Well, to do that, we want to make the front end stiffer. We have to go and change springs on both of these spring and damper units, therefore increasing the stiffness. Unfortunately, now that we've done that, we've actually adjusted the roll stiffness because you've now increased the stiffness of both of your corner springs, the effective roll stiffness is higher. So you can see that this isn't a great solution on its own. What we need is a means of adjusting the roll stiffness separately to the heave stiffness. So what I've done here is I've added what's known as a T-bar. It's a fairly old school way of doing a, a anti-roll bar on a, a single seater or other tight packaging area cars. And the way it works is that you hold the bottom uh, fixed in, in twist in this axis, but obviously it's allowed to pivot. And the idea behind this is that as you start to get uh, wheels moving in roll, so one wheel moving up and the other one moving down, you have rotation through the T-bar. And so because this particular member of the T-bar has a certain degree of stiffness to torsion, uh, it will resist that particular roll. So by either moving these linkages out or in further on the T-bar or by swapping out the T-bar for a bar with a little bit less stiffness, you can control the roll. So now what I would have to do to increase my heave stiffness in the suspension system is to go up the two spring rates on the main dampers and then go through and soften my T-bar. That way the roll stiffness would remain the same and the heave stiffness would increase. This is still not a great solution because now to adjust just the heave stiffness, I've actually had to go and adjust three different springing mechanisms, which is not great. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna add a spring and damper unit that acts on the T-bar. So you can see that what here is I've now got a spring and damper that acts on the T-bar. And what you'll do is you'll see that this acts exclusively in heave. So you can see that as our center spring is being compressed up and down, this causes the motion of the overall system up and down. And this is essentially what a heave spring or third element is. Now, obviously the other spring and dampers will still apply uh, an effective springing and damping coefficient in heave, but now I can go and isolate my tuning of my heave and roll stiffnesses a lot more, basically just apply a base level of springing and damping to the existing corner spring and dampers, and then tune everything else out with this system down the bottom. And because the heave spring doesn't act at all in roll, I can do some wonderfully nonlinear things on it. For example, I can have a spring that doesn't even engage until we get below a certain ride height. So I can have a car that basically drops down and then all of a sudden the springing kicks when it goes down, say 10, 20 millimeters, which can be useful when I'm trying to get around rules or if I'm just trying to maximize mechanical grip at low speeds. We can also do this in a progressive fashion where we have a nonlinear spring that increases its springing rate as it compresses. And we use other items like that to try and tune the heave in for best aero performance. Another real advantage of the heave spring is, is that we can essentially limit the static ride height without having to limit the roll. So what do I mean by this? If we go and take our heave spring and compress it all the way up, we can set the lengths of the heave springs and the other spring and damper units such that our corner spring and dampers still have a little bit of travel left in them. So if I bottom out that heave spring, I can still go and get a little bit of roll on the car. And this is quite useful if you wanna have a car where you can maintain a constant ride height, but you still wanna allow a little bit of roll uh, at the extreme ends of the suspension travel. Because what this means is that I can achieve uh, an infinite heave stiffness effectively at the bottom of my travel by running into the, the end stops of this spring damper unit, but then still have some roll stiffness in hand. And what that means is that if we have a one wheel bump situation on one of the wheels, 
it can actually pass out to the other wheel and you get a little bit more bump compliance, which means a bit more mechanical grip, a bit softer over bumps, while still having really good control of the front ride height and stopping the front ride height from dropping below a certain point. Of course, I've just drawn up one way of doing a heave spring system here. There's of course more than one way of doing a heave spring system. And I'll just show you an alternative method on the rear. So on the rear, I have a slightly different bell crank system where I have my two bell cranks going up. And you can see here, that's how my bell crank is rotating and pushing my damper open and close like that. Same on the other side. And what I'm gonna do is I wanna put a heave system in for this rear axle. Now, of course, I don't have any roll system here, but what I've done is, is just gone and applied something a little bit simpler to illustrate that you can do this in more than one way, which is to go and plonk the heave damper in between the two bell cranks like that. So what happens is that as the bell cranks move around through the travel, you can see that we're actuating the heave system. When we move both suspension arms up, we can see that we still have that roll ability right at the end of the travel. And then at full droop, you can see that we're on the bottom of the heave system there. So this is just another way of implementing a heave system. You see, this is a very simple way of doing it because I've mounted the heave spring exclusively across the bell cranks. This is just to illustrate that there's more than one way in which you can do a heave spring setup. And in fact, there's very many ways in which you can do a heave spring setup. And that is fundamentally how a heave spring works. Well, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to click that like button, hit subscribe to my channel for more, and don't forget to turn on the notification bell for my latest updates. If you have a video suggestion on what you'd like to see next from me, leave a comment in the comment section below, and hopefully, I'll see you next time.